Hello, and welcome to another episode of Rational Actors on Blogging Heads. I'm Kevin Glass, Managing Editor at Town Hall, and today I'm joined by... Hey, I'm Tim Lee. Um, I am a, uh, I guess, Senior Editor is my title at uh, Vox.com. I write about technology. Yeah, so thanks for coming on, Tim. Uh, we're going to talk about net neutrality, and there's been a lot of uh, developments recently uh, kind of that I think portend what the future of the internet's going to look like. Um, but first, I wanted to ask you about the leaked FCC proposal for that would kind of in spirit allow what are called fast lanes um, and ask you how uh, you see this going forward because the FCC was kind of a little um, panicked by this leak and mm -hmm. how you see that affecting the way that we're, we perceive net neutrality and, and what that portends for the future. Sure. So I, I think to understand what's going on here, um, you have to go back to January when um, the FCC had a previous set of net, net neutrality rules that the D.C. Circuit Court here in D.C. Um, said was not consistent with um, the laws that Congress had put out. And so the new chairman of the FCC, Tom Wheeler, has been thinking about um, w what to do in reaction to that. And most people expected him to put forward a new set of network neutrality regulations because both he and President Obama have said they're in favor of net neutrality. Um, and so this was his attempt to uh, deal with that court decision and come up with um, some sort of internet regulations that was um, consistent with that court decision um, and also uh, protected net neutrality, supposedly. Um, and so what, basically what he did was um, he, he came up with a proposal that um, did as much as he thought he could get away with, given the limits that the court had put in place. And specifically, um, it, it, uh, the, the rule, uh, according to reports, and, and this could change once we see the final rule, but the rule, the reports say that um, it, it allows uh, ISPs to give, um, to prioritize different times of traffic if doing so is, is commercially reasonable. Um, and that is a legal term that comes from some previous um, court decisions. And nobody's quite sure what that means specifically. Um, but it, it's generally assumed to mean a, a less strict rule protecting net neutrality um, than the one that the FCC tried to put forward in 2010 and the court said were um, exceeded the FCC's authority. Uh, right. Now, the, uh, the, the so-called fast lane proposal, that applies to what's called, I mean, I'm, I want to clarify here, does that apply to uh, what's called the last mile of the internet, which is between Comcast and the consumer, rather than between uh, Comcast and other uh, packet servicing organizations? Yes, that's right. So, so generally, when we're talking about net neutrality, um, we're focusing on what's called the last mile, which is um, cable companies like uh, Comcast and Time Warner or um, uh, telephone companies like AT&T and Verizon. Um, it's regulations limiting them from uh, giving priority to some content over others on their own network. Um, so there's other parts of the Internet. There's data centers that host uh, you know, websites. There's uh, long distance um, network providers that provide us, you know, what's called transit to get um, traffic from one end of the internet to the other. Um, generally speaking, net neutrality doesn't um, affect those companies. It only affects the companies that are on the consumer facing side um, where consumers are, are signing up for internet access. Right. So, what would um, the advocates of net neutrality, what, what would they say the downsides to this kind of proposal are? Because from my perspective, uh, I would say kind of in my vision of a worst case scenario, right, is that Comcast signs a deal with Hulu um, to provide really fast uh, HD quality video content over the last mile to the consumers. Um, and mm -hmm. because of that, uh, let's say Netflix's service uh, is suboptimal compared to that. So uh, we can, and we could say, you know, in a future where Comcast and Time Warner have merged and they're servicing by far the largest consumer base of any ISP, that that puts uh, Netflix at a huge disadvantage compared to a competitor like Hulu, right? Right. That's right. So I think there's there's two classes of potential problems. Um, the, one is the one you just alluded to, which is that um, Netflix is a potential disruptive innovation for traditional paid television services. So Comcast has, uh, you know, you can subscribe for cable service from Comcast, it might cost you 100 bucks a month or more um, for that service. And if a company like Netflix comes along and offers much more affordable service, a lot of people might want to cancel their service. Um, and so the fear is that Comcast might use its control over on um, that last mile to either 
um, degrade the quality of services like Netflix that they think are a competitive threat, um, or else um, charge Netflix so much money that they're not able to offer a product that's a viable alternative to those cable companies. Um, at, at the other end of the spectrum, the, the other type of concern, I think, is that when you have um, one of the advantages of the current internet architecture is that if you buy a web server somewhere, uh, you basically automatically get uh, reasonably good service everywhere in the world. Like your website, anybody can go download it. It's reasonably fast. Um, and I, I think there's a concern that if ISPs start carving up their networks into fast lanes and slow lanes, um, that might be fine for a big company that's dealing with all these individual ISPs anyway. But if you're a small company just getting into the market, it might just be too burdensome to have to go around to Comcast and AT&T and Verizon and Cablevision and Time Warner Cable and, you know, not to mention in other countries um, and sign all these special fast line deals. And so by default, um, companies that don't have the, the, the money and the logistical uh, resources um, will end up in the slow lane and, and be at a disadvantage. Uh, right. What's the... I guess kind of the the pace of technological advancement seems so fast though that uh let's say you become a competitor to Netflix or um I'm not entirely sure what other kind of entertainment platform might exist but it seems like uh they you might not I mean the the bandwidth might be there anyway to become a competitor, right? And maybe you're not de delivering super HD quality, but you're delivering maybe uh, 480 or 720 to mm -hmm. people's homes. Um, is that really going to be that large of kind of a hurdle to clear? Uh, I mean, I guess it would depend on the difference, the, the, the speed difference between that fast lane and slow lane, right? But is that really going to be a sufficiently large hurdle to clear for uh, let's say new entrance into the market. Yes, yeah, so I think it's it's a little bit hard to to say, right? So um, the fastest, highest bandwidth application right now is high definition video, um, and that may be the 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 fastest thing for the foreseeable future. Um, but it's hard to predict what other kinds of applications might come along, and it's hard to predict um, what people's quality expectations. So the you know TV manufacturers are working on a 4K specification um, that requires significantly more bandwidth than. Um, even HD video today. Um, right now, that's kind of a, seems like something that maybe consumers aren't going to care that much about, but maybe 10 years from now, it'll be seen as standard that everybody's got to have a 4K television set. Um, so, uh, and, and you all, it also depends on, um, you know, how the market evolves. If, um, you know, we hope that uh, ISPs will continue providing more and more bandwidth, but if there's not much competition and they see this as a competitive threat, maybe they'll slow down the, the pace of, um, innovation. I mean, to be clear, th this isn't something that um, that I personally think that uh, is a big threat. I mean, I think in the long run, uh, you know, everybody's going to be fine. Like, networks are keep going to keep getting faster and cheaper and, and all that. But you know, the the difference between it getting faster at kind of a medium pace for getting faster faster rapidly is, I think, a big deal. And I'd rather live in a world where um, you have an open internet where every, everybody has access to the same service. Because if nothing else, you know, you could imagine an alternative universe where YouTube didn't come out long until 2010 or 2012 or something. Um, and that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, but it's good that it came along in, in 2005. Right. Now, um, what I've seen at least a lot of conservatives say is that uh, a large part of these problems and these these fears, which, you know, we are talking purely hypotheticals here because for the most part, uh, the principles of net neutrality are in effect right now without, uh, you know, legal regulations. But and what conservatives I've seen have said is that uh, one of the biggest problems and one of the things that kind of plays into that fear is the monopoly power of a lot of last mile providers um, mm -hmm. that, for example, uh, I'm in Washington, D.C., um, and there are a couple different uh, internet providers and, and cable television providers in Washington, D.C., but only one services where I live right now. I have Comcast right. or nothing. Um, right. But we've seen kind of, and there, there's a lot of backstory to that of telecommunications policy history of why that is. Um, but we're seeing more of a proliferation of competition. And it's not that uh, it's going to become you know, a, a very, very broad market for where you can get your cable and internet uh, services. But, you know, Verizon is building out Fios here. RCN has long been a 
pseudo secondary competitor in the cable market. Um, and conservatives would say that what we need to do is kind of deregulate a lot of these local franchising laws to get some of the competitors. Um, because at that point, then, if Comcast has, uh, you know, a, a high speed lane for one certain kind of video service service and the other organizations don't, they can obviously use that in uh, the competition wars and and no, there won't be the incentive to ha to discriminate based on services that way. Um, mm -hmm. Do you do you think that that is like a, a, a reasonable uh, alternative to, you know, legal regulations that would enforce uh, packet neutrality rules? So um, one of the weird things about broadband networks is if you think about the net market for like shoes, um, everybody pretty much has the option of buying from all the shoe manufacturers, right? Because shoes can be shipped across state lines and there's stores that stock lots of options. Um, broadband is very localized. So, you know, it's, it's, there, there are dozens of broadband providers, but as you were saying, in any given location, there's usually only one or two options. It's usually your cable company and maybe your um, local phone company has a DSL or a fiber option. Um, so it's certainly true that there are uh, some examples of companies upgrading their networks. So Fios, um, it's great that Fios is, is building a fiber optic network, but that's Verizon, who was already a DSL provider. Um, RCN has done a little bit of building out, but it's in a very small number of, of cities. Um, and I think the same is true of Google Fiber, which is a great thing. I'd love to see every city in the country have Google Fiber, but so far I think it's Kansas City and maybe Austin. Um, you know, in, in a year it might be five or ten kind of medium-sized metro areas, but for 90% of us it's still basically going to be Comcast and maybe a, a telephone company. Um, so I, I think that if, if, your, if, if your argument is based on the idea that the, the broadband market is going to get a lot more competitive, um, I, I think that's probably overly optimistic. And I, I've been writing and thinking about these issues for about 10 years, and the debate largely was the same 10 years ago. There's about to be all this competition. Um, and actually, I think um, you know the, the entrance of Fios was a big deal. And one of the reasons I, I was more um, optimistic about this 10 years ago, because you started to see Fios rolling out fiber. And, and the assumption was that AT&T and CenturyLink, the other um, phone companies, would do similarly. I and mean, what you've actually seen recently is that I think the Fios um, financials haven't turned out as well as they'd hoped. I mean, they haven't completely stopped rolling out um, Fios, but um, the speed at which they're doing it has, has slowed. Um, and you have not seen anybody else say, oh, that's a great opportunity, other than Google. Google's basically the only other example you see of somebody who's doing a really ambitious um, rollout of, of broadband in, in more than a, a trivial number of households. So you don't see, I mean, I would agree with that, is that these, these are issues that uh, have been being talked about for a long time now, and we really haven't mm -hmm. seen all that much advancement. I mean, Fios entered the Washington DC market, uh, I don't know, three years ago, maybe. And I'm in a fairly, uh, I would say populated area and we're not even close to, to receiving it. Um, mm -hmm. but I have seen, you know, in other places, uh, my parents are in Houston. They have AT&T U-verse, which I'm not a whole, very familiar with that service, but it is, it does seem right. a co competitor to, I believe Time Warner is the dominant market holder there. Um, right. And to a certain so, yeah, to, extent, to be, I mean, to be clear, like it's it's not the case that the the market's terrible, right? I mean, you know, th there are countries countries where you have one tele uh, telecommunication monopoly, um, and here we at least have cable and, and telephone in most cases, so that's good. Um, and you know, we are seeing people upgrading to fiber, so the situation isn't terrible. The, the question is just what's the counterfactual? I and mean, if you look at something like um, computer chips, like they get you know the, their speed like doubles every eighteen months. Um, you know, and it, it's quite possible that, you know, the Google Fiber has gigabit connections. You can imagine an alternative world where if you somehow did have a lot of competition, maybe gigabit Ethernet, gigabit Internet would be the standard everywhere. Um, and so it's just it's, it's not that the situation is terrible. It's just that you could imagine that it would be a lot faster if you had um, policies that were better at, at promoting innovation. Right, right. Um, I want to move on to uh, the... I don't know if you would call it a deal, the agreement that uh, Comcast signed with uh, Netflix's packet provider, right? Um, yeah. Because we saw um, Netflix, I mean, we've seen, I've seen traffic charts, I think you had one on Vox, about mm -hmm. uh, kind of the degradation of, net, of packet quality um, on Comcast networks when it came to Netflix, because right. uh, Netflix was trying to get... Is it is it level three or cogent that's uh, Netflix's uh, pack 
packet provider. I don't remember. But trying to I, e extract uh, money from them in an agreement that used to be uh, what's called peering, which is a, a uh, fee-free uh, exchange of, of traffic, right? Um, and they were able to extract money for carrying Netflix's traffic. Um, right. And that seems, uh, at least to me and maybe to you, a little more uh, scary for uh, the future of networks because mm -hmm. of, a, of a whole host of different reasons. Um, I think you've written about how the consolidation of Comcast and Time Warner would be a huge development in that area. How do you mm -hmm. see kind of, I don't want to call them rents, but rents being extracted from um, packet providers to last mile providers uh, evolving the internet in the next, you know, 10 years. So this, this is a little bit of a tricky um, thing to explain. And I, I did, I had some diagrams of a um, thing that, of a piece that I did last Friday that maybe you can link to that, that'll help make it a little bit more explain it, explain it, um, understandable. Basically the, the way the internet has traditionally been, um, the way it's traditionally worked is that um, a last mile ISP like Comcast would pay uh, a company like level three for the service called transit, which is basically carrying on traffic over long distances. Um, and one of the advantages of this is that given that the um, transit companies are the ones that are receiving the payments, um, that, that transit market is very competitive. And so the rates that those um, companies pay uh, is set by a competitive part process. And so you don't have to worry too much about anti-competitive types of um, problems. And what's happened recently is that um, the, the largest broadband providers, especially Comcast and Verizon, um, seem to believe that they have um, enough leverage in these negotiations that they can actually start demanding that the money flow in the other direction. That rather than um, Comcast or Verizon paying a company like Level 3 to deliver traffic to it, they say, hey, you're actually, quote unquote, dumping this traffic on our network, and so you should pay us for the privilege of delivering it to our customers. And so there's, there was this big standoff over this where um, Netflix and the companies that Netflix paid to deliver the traffic to these companies said, hey, wait a minute, like that's not traditionally how the internet's worked. It's not reasonable to expect us to pay these fees. And um, Comcast and, and uh, especially Comcast, I think also Verizon, um, responded by saying, well, we're just not going to upgrade the connections between our networks, which meant that as Netflix got more users and as the users use Netflix more, the quality of the, of the um, service went down over time. And so it was basically a game of chicken, right? I mean, each side, each company, their customers were getting hurt. The customers were getting angry at the ISPs. And the question was, which side is going to blink first? Um, and in February or January or February, um, Netflix blinked first and agreed to pay Comcast directly. Um, now, my, my reporting suggests that the amount that they paid was not a huge amount. It was comparable or maybe even less than um, what they had been paying the transit provider. Um, but it set this precedent that... Um, that the, the Comcast is now entitled to charge money to deliver content content to their own customers rather than paying intermediaries or uh, exchanging and so, sometimes networks will just swap traffic for free. Um, it, it's a sign that they now have the, the leverage to demand these kinds of fees and you can imagine over time that they'll be able to jack those fees up and there's the, the problem is that if you're Netflix and you're trying to deliver content to Comcast customers, um, there's no way you can do that going around Comcast. The only way you can do it is if you have a deal with Comcast or with a company that, that in turn has a deal with Comcast. And so Comcast has a lot more leverage in this market than in the transit market where there's lots of different um, companies that that will take traffic from you to Comcast. Right. So I don't, I don't know if that was clear. I think, no, that, I think that was a good explanation. Uh, the main question that gets raised uh, for me is, uh, let's assume that Comcast is not just doing this for, you know, pure profit. Let's say that they're mm -hmm. looking down the road uh, long term. Why would they be trying to establish the precedent that uh, they should be getting paid for by uh, the companies for this traffic? Um, and my question, I, I suppose, that gets raised is you look at the evolution of how uh, basically we receive – entertainment content in our homes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, cable television has been going down, um, you know, the, the phenomenon of cord cutting. Um, and then right. uh, internet video has just absolutely exploded in like the last four years. Um, mm -hmm. could, could this be a case where Comcast and probably some of the other last mile ISPs uh, look at the future and they say the cost of providing internet to people 
uh, or at least the kinds of internet traffic that consumers want is going to go up a lot in the next 10 years because mm -hmm. everyone is going to be switching to high quality internet video and, and possibly other services along these lines, more mm -hmm. gaming maybe, I don't know. Um, right. and, and to them they say, uh, well, there's two ways we can do this. We can try and get more money out of our consumers or we can try and get more money out of the content companies. And the most, uh, I guess, PR friendly way is to go to the content companies rather than the, to the consumers. Because right now, you know, mm -hmm. I went on uh, Comcast.com and you see that it's cheaper to get internet from Comcast than cable television. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe we see that change in the next 10 years, but maybe it's just a case that the price of consuming internet content from Comcast, from anyone really, uh, is gonna go up because of the type of content that we're consuming via the internet. Right, so, so I, one of the things I, I think is important to, to point out here is that the, um, if you look at the cost of internet, um, of long distance internet traffic, um, they've gone down by a factor of a thousand over the last 15 years or so. Um, so this is a very, very competitive market and just from technological improvement, um, I, I think that's likely to continue. So it's certainly true that the volume of traffic that Comcast is handling is likely to go up over time. Um, but I don't see any evidence, evidence to think that their costs are going to go up significantly. If anything, I would expect um, the overall cost of, of the service they're providing, or at least the cost of um, getting the traffic from the rest of the world to, um, to the kind of local network where they then have to deliver to customers, is going to go down because um, networks are just getting so fast. There's so much bandwidth available. Um, so, I, you know, certainly I, I think that they... Um, I would assume they're worried about having a future where people um, subscribe to Netflix rather than subscribing to cable television. Um, but the thing is, like, if, if they establish the precedent that they get to charge everybody, you know, charge both ends of the network, um, then in a sense it doesn't matter that much if um, Netflix disrupts their television business because they can just charge Netflix, you know, what, whatever um, wh whatever value they think that consumers um, put place on this content, they can either charge the consumers directly or they can charge Netflix or some combination. Um, and so the, the ability to, um, it, that could undermine Netflix's ability to disrupt this market because um, they're, if you have to pay a toll to the company you're trying to disrupt, that doesn't really work. Okay, so um, I, I think that that, that makes sense that maybe, um, I guess the pace of technological innovation is going to be such that uh, delivering more and more uh, high quality, uh, high bandwidth traffic to consumers probably doesn't raise their costs all that much. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder, um, so what you wrote about it, uh, well, is the, the kind of consolidation of some last mile telecoms companies, specifically the, the potential um, of Comcast and Time Warner to merge. Uh, what right. are the fears that you see there in in kind of the monopoly power that they'll be able to exert over uh, some of the other packet and, and content companies? Well, so I, th I think it'll just make all of these problems worse. So I think we're we're kind of at a tipping point here, where um, you're, you're continue part of the reason you're continuing to see quality problems with um, some of these. Uh, so, sorry to back up. So you have all these um, transit companies, um, the companies that do the long distance. Uh, internet service and these big broadband providers and the links between them are very congested right now because both sides think the other should um, bear more of the costs of upgrading those links. Um, part of the reason that that's happening is that there's there's this kind of balance right now where um, it's kind of not clear, you know, it seems like Comcast has the upper hand, but it's not super clear. Um, if you add another 5 or 10 or 15% market share um, to Comcast, they're going to have even more leverage, and so they're going to be able to go out to even more um, intermediaries and say, you need to start paying us, um, start making these kinds of demands. Um, and I think that the, the, the reason that's a problem is if you look at the history of telecommunications, anytime you have a monopoly where you have one company that has a unilateral ability to demand money from everybody else on the network, um, it's very hard for governments to resist regulating that. I mean, you know, they, they basically have to step in and regulate it because you don't want... Um, you know, you, you don't want companies taking advantage of consumers. And so I think there's a, we should all be very concerned about finding ways to preserve um, the market structure that had existed for the previous 20 years, where because um, you had a competitive market that was kind of setting prices, 
um, you didn't have to worry about government intervention. And so I think it's the, the, the market is kind of on the edge of being broken right now. And if, if the, these companies get even more concentrated, um, it's going to be an even bigger mess. That eventually, I think that regulators are going to have to do something about this. And um, anything they have to do is going to be harder to do if you have an even bigger and more um, concentrated uh, company. I, th I, th I, th I think the good right analogy here is, is the old AT&T monopoly. So in the 60s and 70s, um, the FCC tried a number of policies to try to get AT&T to behave itself. Um, they had a number of regulations about what they could do and couldn't do in the computer market. They had regulations requiring um, AT&T to allow third-party devices like modems on their network. Um, and eventually what they realized was that there's just so many ways that AT&T can screw up potential competitors and, and you know, misbehave that it's just very hard for a regulator to control the behavior of a company. And so what they needed to do was break up the company because once you have a bunch of small companies, it's much easier um, to kind of keep a watchful eye on them and make sure they're not misbehaving than one big company. Um, and so I think that it's, it will just be um, all the all the, the policy dilemmas we'll have over the next decade are going to be worse if there's one big cable monopoly rather than two kind of medium-sized ones. Uh, so one of the questions I think uh, ha I've seen written a lot about is, is the role that um, both mobile and mobile competition play into this, right? Is mm -hmm. that uh, at what point would people cut the cord entirely? Um, and what, at what point are mobile networks good enough that you can live on, on pure mobile data and not have, uh, you know, wireline internet service? Because that, um, the, the wireline, mono or not monopoly, but at, like I said, at, at the wireline level, uh, I have Comcast that services me. Uh, right. I have a ton of different mobile carriers that can service me that are uh, a little more competitive. You know, there's, you could call it an oligopoly. There's, I don't know what the market share of the combination of AT&T, Verizon, uh, T-Mobile, and, and Sprint is, but th mm -hmm. those are the big four, right? But right. at least they're kind of competing pretty intensely for my business. Whereas uh, at the wireline level, there's, again, just one company. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a point at which there might be, I mean, is there a technological point at which uh, we might be happy cutting the cord entirely from wireline services? I mean, people are ju are perfectly happy, it seems, watching YouTube videos on online and on their TVs and whatever, and those are those can be incredibly low quality, but they're still providing uh, enough entertainment, at least for a lot of different people. Right. So um, th this is again something. Um, so so first of all, like obviously we don't know. Um, you know, technology and markets have ways of surprising us, and so. It, you know, it might be anything I say would be speculation. Um, but a co couple of things to say about that. One is that this is something that people have pre been predicting for a long time. I mean, again, if you go back to 2004, uh, you have the same kind of conversation. Like, yes, there's not enough competition in wireline, but um, wireless is about to come and you're about to have faster networks. And in some to some extent, that happened, right? I mean, obviously, today's LTE networks are way, way faster than the networks you had in 2004. I mean, there bar barely were data networks at all back then um, uh, in wireless. Um, however, the, the, I think there's a fundamental issue of physics, which is that if you look at a, um, the coaxial cable that get, brings your Comcast data to you, um, the, the basic idea of that is you have that cable where you have the entire electromagnetic spectrum available for just you and a few of your neighbors to get content. Um, whereas what, over the air, you're sharing, um, you're not only sharing capacity with a lot of other users, you know, the, the, there's a limited amount of spectrum. You're not only sharing it with a bunch of other, your neighbors, um, but you're also sharing it with television and radio and military applications and astronomy. And there's all these other things that people are doing with that spectrum. Um, right. So I think it's always going to be the case that, uh, you know, a, a strand of glass or a coaxial cable is going to have more bandwidth than um, a wireless connection. Um, and you see that in practice in the data caps that um, these wire wireless companies have. So it's absolutely true. You can... Um, if money is no object, you could hook up your um, TV to your cell phone and get kind of mediocre but, but passable um, data. But the problem is you'd blow through your bandwidth caps in a matter of probably right. minutes or hours. Um, and uh, right now, I don't think there's any cellular companies that will sell you a large enough data plan that you can, um, that is a, a reasonable alternative for, um, for a service like Comcast if what you want to do is stream a lot of video over Netflix or Amazon or something like that. Um, now, now you, you could imagine a, a world where bandwidth gets so plentiful that even though your Comcast connection has 10 times the bandwidth of your wireless connection, the wireless connection is still fast enough that you can do everything and everything works out. And you know, I'm absolutely not saying that won't happen. 
Um, but I think for the foreseeable future, um, people will kind of push the boundaries of the amount of bandwidth available. And so it's always going to be the case, not always, but for the foreseeable future, it's going to be the case that the companies that have wires in the ground are going to have more bandwidth to sell you than the companies that have to share all that spectrum um, over the air. Okay. Um, so the, the last thing I wanted to get to is uh, in, I believe it was 2008, you wrote uh, a paper that, that I thought was fantastic for the Cato Institute um, on on net neutrality and kind of the, the principles going forward. And basically, uh, correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong here, you laid out that the principles of net neutrality are, are worthy public policy goal, uh, mm -hmm. but the best way, or, but government regulation was not going to be the best way to, I mean, both preserve net neutrality and uh, allow for the innovation necessary going forward. Um, and you've right. kind of evolved from that point. Do you want to tell me... Uh, how you've evolved from that position and what made you change your mind that you do think we need stricter rules from the FCC on net neutrality? Sure. So actually, I, I think most of what you just said, I still agree with. I'm, I'm not convinced that net neutrality rules are the, the really key thing that we need to, to deal with these issues. Um, so there are a couple, the, the key thing that I think really changed my mind is we were talking a few minutes ago about that game of chicken that Netflix was playing with Comcast. Um, and you actually, if, I think it's in the mid, like 20, page 25 or so in, in my Cato study, I actually walked through a hypothetical example. It wasn't exactly the, the, the situation that happened between Comcast and Netflix, but basically I said, let's suppose that you get down to a kind of confrontation where um, a big company like a, a big ISP tries to get money out of a big um, content provider. And my prediction was that a combination of bad PR and um, kind of game theoretic considerations in the structure of the market would make it impossible for the ISP to win that showdown, right? And that was an empirical prediction. I said, you know, if, if this were to ever to happen, um, this, is, this is how it would turn out. Um, and then the world sort of ran the, the thing I had been predicting about, and the result came out the opposite of the way um, that it had predicted. And this actually first happened in 2010. There was a dispute also involving Netflix between um, Level three was the transit provider then, and Comcast was the, the other party. And, um, and it was the, the content side that blinked in that confrontation. Um, and so that made me think that, um, the, uh, that I underestimated the amount of market power that these uh, last mile providers had, and that um, I needed to think more carefully. Now, I, I think that many of the things I wrote in the paper is still true. I mean, I, you know, I made the point that um, there's a lot of you know, danger of unintended consequences, and, we, um, and also that it's actually somewhat difficult to define what net neutrality means in a way that um, will actually accomplish the goal of protecting um, an open internet with low barriers to entry. And I think that's still mostly true. I mean, I think that, um, I think that's especially true now that you have the inter interconnection issues in addition to traditional net neutrality issues, um, because it's, it's pretty easy to write a rule that says, if you've got all this data coming in over one big pipe, you have to treat all those packets equally. But if you've got a company that has 20 different pipes, you know, that are connected in 20 different cities and, um, you know, they have different deals with each of those providers, it's much harder to write a rule that accomplishes what you really want to accomplish, which is to try to, to uh, have some kind of level playing field among those. Um, and so I think actually the FCC is in a really tough spot here. I, I think that um, so, some of the advocates of net neutrality or of, um, other kinds of regulation are, are take a little bit too much of an optimistic view and think that the you know if the FCC just kind of gets tough that we can protect the open internet. Um, I think probably the FCC is going to have to do some things, um, but I think it's far from obvious what those things are, and I think that um, it's it's going to take a lot of trial and error and a lot of um, hard thinking to to come up with the right approach. Right. I mean, I've seen the. Uh, proposal put forward, I guess, again and again, that reclassification of inter of broadband services is kind of the uh, hammer that the FCC can use here. Um, mm -hmm. But it seems like the FCC is super, super hesitant to do that. Um, I think for a couple reasons. One, because uh, legislators on Capitol Hill actually do seem to have a coherent idea of what that would mean for the FCC's power. Um, mm -hmm. And they're, they seem very against it. And the FCC needs to be a little more subtle if they do want to kind of preserve some of the principles of net neutrality. Um, mm -hmm. But also that, that that's, that's kind of used as kind of a, oh, this will solve all the problems. Uh, we can just reclassify and then do whatever we want. Um, and that might not necessarily be 
either the easiest or the best way uh, to accomplish what net neutrality advocates are pushing for. Right. So to be clear, the, the, the Telecommunication Act that Congress passed in 1996 had two categories of services. Um, you had one category that was kind of a low regulation category and one that was a high regulation category. And the FCC, the reason FCC lost that court case this year is that they put it, uh, broadband service in the low regulation category. Right. Um, yeah. the, I Sorry, think the, yeah. the key... Yeah, I mean, I think the key thing to, to remember about reclassification is that it's not really a policy, right? I mean, the reclassification is a legal is, is a change of legal category that then gives the FCC some new powers, but it doesn't answer the question of what should the FCC do with those powers? You know, what should the actual right. regulations that they write look like? And um, I think there's a lot of people. And, and so, I mean, you know, look, if, if, if you're a strong supporter of net neutrality, you really want regulations. Um Reclassification might be a precondition to anything that you otherwise would want the, the FCC to do. So I think it's not crazy for, for people on the left to be focusing on that as a goal. But it's not a sufficient condition to accomplish the policy goal of protecting the open Internet. Um, you would have to reclassify and then do some other stuff. And I think there's actually a number of different other things they could that they could do. And I think it's not obvious which of those is going to be the most effective. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the... Like you said, they lost the court case because uh, they're in that lower tier of of regulation, and uh, mm -hmm. presumably, you know, they the FCC would be able to win those cases uh, if they did reclassify. Um, That's right. So yeah. Um, so and what did seem interesting is that is the that the fast lane proposal is is kind of a, a response to that court case, which um, seems to be a precedent that you know just like the the comcast netflix payment uh agreement is like you said less of less of a being about now rather than setting a precedent the, the fast lane proposal seems to more be setting a precedent that those kinds of deals would be legal under the current regulatory regime yeah i think that's true although it's, it's actually not clear so so people i, I think people who on the left who want to denigrate it, describe it as a fast lane proposal. That, that's not how the chairman um, has characterized it. The, the right, way he yeah. characterized it is that, that, that this is the most, this, that this, um, so the legal, the legal standard here is, is commercially reasonable discrimination. And I think the way that he is selling this to people on the left is that um, basically the FCC will interpret commercially reasonable in as strict a manner as possible. And so they'll get something close to, um, a net neutrality rule, or there might be a certain amount of fast lanes, but it'd be fairly open and transparent, and I'm not actually sure exactly what it means. But right, um, yeah. but but I think that the goal, part of the goal, is that because nobody's sure what commercially reasonable means, it's possible that if you had a net neutrality friendly FCC, that in practice they could do many of the same things they would have done under the previous net neutrality rule, and maybe it would take the courts a, a few years to reach the conclusion that actually you kind of snuck a net neutrality rule in the back door. Right. Um, now, yeah. I actually think in some ways that's a terrible outcome, right, because it means that nobody has any certainty. Um, you know, startups have no certainty about whether they'll be able to, you know, get access to the bandwidth they need, and also, you know, broadband companies have no certainty about what kind of regulatory regime they'll have. So I, I think that's kind of suboptimal for everybody. Um, but if you are um, determined at net neutrality and not willing to go the reclassification route, it probably is the, the best you're going you're gonna to get from shorter reclassification. Right. Uh, all right. I think that's about all the time we have for today. Thanks a lot for joining me, Tim. Um, oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. And I would encourage everyone to go read uh, your your those graphs that you were talking about earlier were very, very helpful in kind of explaining um, how a lot of this works. So I would encourage everyone to go read that. Um, all right. I appreciate that. But yeah, thanks again, and I will see everyone next time on Blogging Heads.